Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Move Well to Age Well with Helene Kapsoftis. The hardest part of this show was learning how to pronounce her name correctly. <laughs> today, she's going to be talking about how posture impacts your strength and civility. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to see you again. Yes, always nice to be here. I love the opportunity to connect with your audience. They are a bunch of beautiful people inside. Well, I love you. You know, I hear from a lot of them that have booked, have taken some of your courses and booked private sessions. All I hear is rave reviews. Well, all I ever get is compliments and thanks from your audience, which is, it just goes to show how great they are. I mean, you know? how many people have jobs like that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited because I'm sure that I slouch and I, and I'm, I'm sitting up right now so that I can not be scolded. So I can't wait to see what you have to say. Well, I don't ever wag my finger at anybody. I never, I've never done that because it's it, usually we're doing things because we don't know more about it. And, uh, you know, it's all about knowledge. And then, of course, as long as the person's making an informed decision, I just respect what decision they make. So I don't wag my finger. Maybe at my kids I did, but... <laughs> So, all right, well, I'm going to share my screen now if I'm able to, and I get my slides on there. Now you have a skeleton. Is that because you're a physical therapist or because it's almost Halloween? That is Betty Bones. And I bring Betty Bones a lot when I, because I do a lot of live classes and a lot of uh, free events and I'm teaching online all the time. And so, um, yeah, I just need you to enable me to Oh, I didn't screen. do that. How dare no. I? Sorry. I was there waiting for you sorry and you were that. waiting for me. I'm so sorry. Okay. So yeah, Betty Bones has come in very handy because when you, you got that in front of you, you can show a lot of things. So everybody can see this now, I hope. Yes. Perfect. And so, um, you know, as you said, the title of this is How Posture Impacts Strength and Stability. And hopefully I'll give a little insight into that. Of course, I could talk about this for days on end. So I've tried to encapsulate it into a, a sort of a distilled picture of things where people can get enough information to know how to move forward. So this is always one of my favorite things to state understanding authentic human movement. And that is what I teach, authentic human movement, not isolating, not fragmenting out body parts because everything's connected to everything else. Um, and when you understand that, it does lead to making better training choices and, and you end up with improved results with whatever your goals are, whether it be to increase your strength or to run better or to golf better or any of those things. So it's important that we know what authentic human movement is. And that's my passion to teach that. And then, of course, I'm always saying, because I am going to be showing people how to assess their posture today, I am going to be showing people how to assess their balance, both dynamic and static, and uh, some movements. I don't know what's going on in the world of the people viewing this. I don't want anyone to ever hurt themselves. And so I just want to caution people, you know, don't do these things if you know you shouldn't get permission if you're not sure. And obviously, it's always a good idea to work with a movement professional if you believe that you need that guidance. So that's always good to know. Now, we're talking about posture today. And I do want to share with you that ideal posture is an idea. And you might be surprised at that because I don't know there's anybody on the planet who has ideal posture. And what I mean by that is they're completely symmetrical, front to back, side to side. Every body part is exactly the opposite of the, of the body part on the other side. And there's no asymmetry anywhere. That is not going to happen. But the issue with ideal posture is the further away from what ideal is deemed to be, the more that your body needs to compensate in order for you to perform tasks of daily life. And when the, you know, when you're not doing this, when you are compensating, that's when all the things happen that we don't want to happen. That's when structures break down, when things wear out because they're doing jobs on end that they're not designed to do. So we want to get as close to ideal posture as we can, but I want people to know, don't expect yourself to be absolutely perfect, right side, left side, front to back, because that's not going to happen, but you want to get as close to it as you can optimally. 
Now, the spinal curves, we have those curves there for a very real purpose. It was a, a brilliant design because it allows the spine to be eight times stronger than it would be if it was straight up and down. And because of those curves, it provides the, str the, the strength and the proper mobility for the muscles to perform as they're designed to perform, which means if you're lacking any curve in the neck, maybe you've got a forward head and might even not even have, this is a lordosis because it curves in the same with the low back, that's a lordosis. And when it curves out, that's a kyphosis. And the pelvis of course is fused once you've hit, you know, beyond infancy. And so those things here, sometimes if people have a forward head or they've maybe been involved in a fender bender or stopped at a red light and someone rear-ended them and they get that contra coup, that head goes forward and back, that kind of whiplash effect, that can sometimes flatten the uh, cervical spine, the neck. And so now their head's going to be in a very different posture than it really is designed to be in. And the muscles that all come up into the neck, and I'm going to show some pictures of some muscles I've got a few pictures there. They might be overwhelming to those of you who are not anatomy experts. I'm not going to go through all the muscles. I just want you to see some pictures so you have a good understanding of just how many muscles are involved in posture. So it's not just about working one muscle where, you know, depending on the YouTube channels that you check out or the people who um, <clears throat> you're counting on to educate you on a topic, they can only teach what they know. And so it's important to get different viewpoints on these things because a lot of people get their education in different ways. So, so that said, if this head is forward, it's going to radically alter how the spine functions. Your, your neck, because of how these joints are aligned in the spine, how the vertebrae stack on each other, your neck is at about a 45 degree angle where it's sitting on it. And it has full range forward bending, backward bending, side bending, right and left, and turning right and left because of how it's set up. And then your thoracic spine is the same thing. That, that's at about a 60 degree angle. <clears throat> and it also can do all those motions. But then the lumbar spine, the way it's designed, it's at about a 90 degree angle stacked upon each other. And you can see it's much bigger vertebrae because it's a lot more weight bearing. Your, your low back can be the strongest link in the body if it's being fed properly with motion from above and below because the lumbar spine strength is bending forward and back. So we don't want the lumbar spine to have to rotate because it's not really designed to rotate. It doesn't mean you shouldn't rotate because we rotate all the time. You can't get out of a car without turning. You can't work in your kitchen and go from the sink to the refrigerator and the stove if you don't turn well. <clears throat> but the point is, all of these spinal curves and how things are stacked and how the spine functions mechanically is what allows all the muscles that attach to have the right ability to do their job. And if we're lacking any of these, or, or if it's increased too much in certain areas, it will definitely impact the function of your muscles. And it will also change your center of gravity, how you're keeping your, your balance. Now, if you have a forward head, I thought people would enjoy learning this, depending on the size of your stature, you know, if you're, if you're a six foot, 10 inch individual or a five foot individual, you're probably going to have a different size head and a different weight to your head. So uh, the average head weighs 10 to 14 pounds, and that's the stress that these muscles are designed to handle so that it can turn your head or your body can turn below your head and you can keep your head upright. Those muscles are very well designed to handle that. When your head starts to come forward, it's a physics thing. It's kind of like a, a longer lever arm, <clears throat> excuse me, creates a lot more stress. If you're just holding a little five pound dumbbell and your elbows are bent and it's right in front of your body, it, you know, it only feels like five pounds, but you straighten your arm out at shoulder height and you hold it there for a while, that five pounds starts to feel really heavy. Well, it's the same thing with your head. So when your head is beyond neutral, and it's at about 15 degrees of flexion, it puts the stress of about 27 pounds on those muscles. And then you can see it increases incrementally up to about 60 pounds of pressure on those muscles. And I want you to notice this. You notice this person's head is forward, and they're not looking down at the floor. They're looking straight ahead, because that's where our eyes are, are and we want to see what's going on in front of us. So 
what that tends to do is kind of shorten the muscles between the skull and the upper neck to keep that head looking forward. So now we're kind of stuck in extension at the upper cervical spine and all kinds of things are, you know, to put it bluntly, out of whack, not the way that's optimal for us at all. Now, the thoracic spine, it is called the silent saboteur by the Gray Institute. Um, Gary Gray is the founder of the Gray Institute, a brilliant, brilliant man. His nickname is the father of function. And he calls the T-spine the silent saboteur. And what it means by that is very often people will not have any symptoms in the trunk. They won't have any pain in that area of the body, but they'll have lots of pain in their shoulders or their neck or their low back. And a lot of it has to do with the fact if that thoracic spine or that trunk has lost what would be ideal curvature, that nice healthy kyphosis, and it kind of flattens and loses it, or with the serious forward head, it it rounds it out a lot more. It becomes that almost that dowager's hump that no one ever wants to have. And it can definitely lead to all kinds of issues. As I said, low back, neck, shoulder. Now it might even be in a pretty good curve. However, it might have lost movement in one of the planes of motion. It might lack being able to flex well or side bend to the right or rotate to the left. And if that happens, again, all those compensatory mechanisms have to be created for the body in order for you to perform your daily tasks. Now, I was looking for some updated research before I presented this, and I came across this study, which I found really, really interesting. And what they found was if a forward head posture is created from working on computers for more than six hours a day, it leads to deficits, balance deficits, literal balance deficits. They tested these people. Um, they had 30 subjects and, uh, they worked on computers over six hours a day. And then 30 subjects who rarely work with computers. It was like less than an hour a day. And they saw a big difference. They saw their center of gravity moved forward and that reduced their ability to maintain their balance. And they tested that six different ways. They tested it with their, their vision and this moved. They tested it where their vision was blocked. They had a blindfold on. Um, they did it six different ways, really well done study, and they saw a big impact in these people's ability to maintain their balance. And it was all because of that forward head posture. They, they measured the angle and it was due to being on the computer. So I, I thought you might want to know this because a lot of the times, a lot of people have neck problems and I've not done any specific public teaching on the neck. I've done a lot of it in my academy with my students live classes, but uh, I will at some point do an event on the neck because it, it's a big deal. However, what a lot of people don't understand is we all know that we have discs in between our vertebrae, but a lot of people don't know there's no disc between the skull and the first cervical vertebrae. And there's no disc between the first and the second cervical vertebrae. It only from between the third or sorry, between the second and the third and down. And the reason for that is how those bones are designed, the, the shape, the, you know, where the nooks and crannies are, how they connect with each other, how they sit on each other. And the majority of nodding your head up and down occurs between the skull and C1. And the majority of rotating your head right and left occurs between C1 and C2. The rest of the cervical vertebrae kind of follow along with the motion. So it's really important what happens at the upper cervical spine. And if you've got a real forward head and then you're lifting your head up so you can look ahead and not looking down at the floor, that's going to really impair the function of these top two vertebrae. So you will end up with some neck issues. Now, fascia. Fascia is a very important aspect to human function. And so I wanted to touch on this, even if it's just briefly, and then you can sort of keep this in the back of your mind with the other slides I'm going to show you. And <clears throat> this, is, this is a cross section where you kind of divide the neck and around the C5-6 level, which is lower neck, and um, you just kind of remove the top and look down in. And actually, I think this is a, a, 
a lower view. So you're looking up. So you remove the top of the neck and you're looking up at the top of the neck. And I wanted you to see here all these different compartments. Now, each of these in these little compartments are muscles. And I'm not going to name them all. I don't want your eyes to glaze over. But I do want you to see just how important the fascia is because it's not like you've got a whole bunch of muscles. It's sort of like you've got one muscle, but it's separated by all these compartments of fascial tissue. And the fascia is very highly innervated. It, when it's healthy, it's well hydrated. It's a very fluid system. Then it is a system. It's on a cellular level around the entire body, like a three-dimensional body stocking. You've got superficial fascia. You've got deep fascia. It surrounds your brain, your nerves, your blood vessels, your lymph vessels. It's everywhere. And so it's really important that <clears throat> we don't ignore that system either when we're training our body, but know that fascia responds really well to movement too, especially if you're doing the right kind of movement. Now, I'm just going to kind of go quickly through these slides. I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this, but I wanted you to see just how many muscles there are in the neck. So if you've been taught to stretch your upper trap or to stretch your sternocleidomastoid or, or whatever, you're kind of ignoring all the other muscles. So we really want to be treating the body as a whole and training the body as a whole. And I wanted you to see here, you've got this, this fascial tissue, the muscle kind of invests into fascial tissue, which provides a lot more where it's the fascial tissue, tissue is thicker. It really provides a great stabilizing force and a lot more strength to the body function wise. And, you know, you can see here, you've got these big front neck muscles, and then you've got a lot of deep neck muscles. It's important to see just how many there are. You can see there are a lot of them. And if I name them all, we'd be here until next week. So I won't do that, but I wanted you to see these visuals. And then especially here, you can see these obviously this is going to impact the position of the head or if the position of the head is impacted because of postural changes in the body, these muscles will be influenced by that change and it will impact how they function. And then I wanted you to see the front of the body. A lot of the times people have forward shoulders and they're kind of stooped forward. So the whole front of the body. Now this is abdominal aponeurosis here, which is a very strong sheath of fascia and layer upon layer. And it creates a lot of stability. Fascia is a beautiful stabilizing force uh, as well as impacting the, the posture of the body and the position of the body. I've taught a lot of classes on, you know, I do a monthly class on this every month and, and uh, you can influence this. You can change your postural position in like 15 minutes it, when you know the right things to do. And here's the back, you know, again, we've got the, the thoracolumbar fascia here. This is all the superficial muscles, the deep muscles. These all need to be functioning well also to keep help keep you upright, to pull those shoulders back in that pop, um, very healthy posture where you're not trying. I mean, if you're sitting there and you're trying to hold yourself up and you're trying to pull your head back and you're trying to pull your shoulders back, that is a conscious effort. We want the body to be keeping you in a healthy posture subconsciously without effort. That's really how we're designed to be. And then if you're doing a lot of sitting, these muscles are definitely going to be shortened and they can yank on your low back when you go to stand up. So that posture is definitely going to create back pain almost directly. And then the backside, when you're sitting on those muscles, muscles lose strength and size and function when you sit on them, especially if it's for hours and hours a day and it's for years. If your job requires you to sit. Maybe you're a bus driver, a truck driver, a cab driver, or an office worker, and you have to sit. I teach a lot of strategies on how to negate that. As a matter of fact, I just did a YouTube series. I think the second and the third ones will be released in the next week or so on how to impact the pain from sitting. So hopefully everybody will want to check those out. So almost done here with these pictures of muscles, uh, you know, your thighs, yes, your knees, are radically influenced by your hips. I like to joke and, and say that, you know, this leg bone here, 
when it comes to the top of the knee. And then you've got a shin bone that comes up to the bottom of the knee. So the knee actually is your lower hip and your upper ankle. Um, that's, that's really how it functions. And a lot of the times the poor knee gets so beat up because people don't understand that and they're just treating the knee and they're not looking at what's causing the problem. But I wanted you to see, yes, your posture will be influenced by the muscles in the legs as well. And then the foot, if that subtalar joint, and I did a lot of YouTube videos on patello or um, sorry, plantar fasciitis, but I taught a lot on the foot and, and how gait occurs in the body and how everything influences everything else. And it's really important that people understand that, you know, their foot might be influencing their posture. If they're, if their heel is, is this is the left foot from behind. So you're looking at the foot from the back and this is the left foot. If that heel bone is kind of in or out, it's going to create a supinated foot. It's going to create a pronated foot. And, uh, and it's in your posture is going to be influenced by that. So uh, I'm going to go downstairs and show everyone how to sort of assess your posture, a real basic way to assess the posture, and then how to assess your, your balance or your stability, both static and dynamic, which means when you're standing still and when you're moving, and then a couple of exercises that hopefully will get everybody started to improve things should they find some deficit or impairment. But I did want to briefly mention that I am hosting another boot camp the end of next month, and it's going to be on reverse aging. And um, hopefully everybody will find some interest in that. It is a five-day boot camp, 90 minutes a day, and I'll be teaching on a lot of the, the myths of aging that uh, is really not truth because we are designed to live a really long, really healthy life filled with joy, not with pain and uh and deficit and impairment so and we're not meant to decline so all right i am done with those um i don't know did were there any questions on the slides aj before oh, i get upstairs um, i i was watching your presentation i wasn't even looking at the chat because okay. so i can do that later too yeah, we can we can do the questions after and I'll, I'll check my phone to see if any were sent in but i was watching okay. everyone else Perfect. and susanna is mentioning that your boot camps are fantastic Oh, yes. Hi, Susanna. Okay. I'm going to head downstairs and I'll see everybody in just a minute. All right. Great. I'll talk to them. Hello. So we have two shows tomorrow at one at the usual time, which is 11 a.m. Pacific time. It's Ocean Robbins talking about plant-based coaching. If any of you are interested in making a difference or just want to learn some of the things that they offer, then please tune in. And at nine o'clock, we have Dr. Lori Marvis, and she's going to be talking about it's either five or six ways to lower your blood pressure naturally. So I hope you'll come in. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider doing that. And if you want to, I don't hardly ever ask you guys to subscribe because, uh, but you can and give it a thumbs up if you like. I know a lot of people on YouTube say that every time. I don't really say that or even to share. But anyway, we're back now on location in the gym with Eileen. Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, so how... Um... I know a lot of people are very concerned about their posture, especially as they age, because nobody wants to end up, you know, like this. I mean, I've seen it's broken my heart sometimes seeing some people who over the decades, because these are very elderly people where they're literally like this and they can't even really look forward. I, I, I'm not even sure how they function. I've seen them walking down the street and it breaks my heart. And so what I want to do is show people, you know, what is ideal posture per se, but as you all know, nobody has perfect posture. It's how far away from ideal posture are you? And then that kind of gives you a clue should you start doing something about it. So typically what I'll tell people is um, if you can stand against a wall and depending on your stature, you know, you don't, you don't want to necessarily be right smack against the wall with your heels. You would like a little bit of a space. And, you know, I don't have my backside against the wall at this point, but if I lean back just a little bit, I am against the wall. And if you can put your hands up, but before you even put your hands up, can you get your head straight against the wall and feel your shoulder blades nice and flat against the wall? So my, I'm, 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 I'm pulling my shoulders back slightly just so I can feel the pressure into the wall. And if you feel like you're looking up like this in order to get your head against the wall, then there ideally there's some space between your head and the wall. So make sure you're looking straight ahead 
even if you tuck your chin, if there's space between your head and the wall, see if you can measure it, you know, come out and see, oh, I'm an inch away from the wall or however that is. Now me, thankfully, I can get my head straight back no problem. And then if your shoulders and your upper thoracic spine are functioning well, ideally you can put your arms against the wall. So from my elbows to my fingertips. Now I do have a little space in my wrist here because there's a little extension when I do that. So I'm not completely flat. So I don't want you all to freak out if the back of your wrists aren't touching. But the idea is elbows and the back of your hands, or at least your fingers, and my shoulders are against the wall as well, and my head's against the wall, and I can come all the way up, keeping those forearms against the wall, and I can come all the way down, keeping those forearms against the wall. Now, that requires your top of your spine, your thoracic spine, just below your neck, in order to extend to get those arms up, and obviously it requires full external rotation of your shoulders and the ability for them to abduct and adduct. So, you know, you may have some shoulder issues. And a lot of the times shoulder issues are because there's other things going on in the body. Your shoulder really depends on your pelvis and your trunk uh, and your scapula or your shoulder blade. They all feed each other. So, uh, and I know I'm pretty sure we did something on shoulders, AJ. I've been here for that. So, so that said, that's kind of an assessment. See where you're at. You know what your starting point is. And now I'm going to show you a couple of assessments for balance or stability. Now there's static and there's dynamic. And um, static means you're just kind of standing still. I'm just going to change my view here because I'm kind of tiny and I need to see myself a little bit better because I can't tell what you can see. And um, there we go. So what what I want you to know is when you're standing still, it's not a real authentic assessment of your balance. And I know a lot of the times in my profession is does this all the time. They'll take an older person and they'll tell them, you know, you can you can balance on one foot. And can you stand on that one foot for 10 seconds? You know, they might even have you try it with your eyes closed. Well, I will tell you, the majority of people do not fall when they've been standing still. They fall because they're moving and balance really needs to be trained in movement, not stillness, because it's a dynamic function that's required of the body. You need your body needs to be able to maintain your stability when you're moving through space. A lot of people, when they fall, especially as they get older, they say, I don't know what happened. I just turned. I was in the kitchen and I turned. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor. So it's not because they were standing still at the counter dealing with food. It's because they moved and their body didn't know how to control the movement. So that's much more important. But your typical static assessment, which means standing still without moving, you know, they'll have you put, can you put one foot in front of the other and be in that tandem position, right? Where you've got, you've got your, your heel in front of your toe. And can you stay that? And then of course, can you do it with depending on whichever foot is forward? And can you keep that for 10 seconds? Depending on, you know, you might be better on one foot for 10 seconds than you are on the other foot for 10 seconds, those kind of things. Um, now there's a dynamic stability test and that will test things like, how are you with real life? Can you sit down in a chair without having to put your hands on something? Now, if you were taught by somebody because your balance is off to always reach for the chair before you sit down so you know the chair is there and you're safe, don't negate that, that warning that you've been taught by someone. But can you sit down without using your arms? And can you get up without using your arms? Can you turn your body? So can you, can you turn, like if you're standing there, can you turn and look over your shoulder? And when you do that, you'll feel the weight shift. When I turn to the right, I feel the weight shift in my feet. My left knee wants to bend a little bit as I'm looking behind me. And then the same thing to the left. Now my right knee wants to bend a little bit and I'm, and I'm feeling that weight shift. Is that happening in your body or is your body kind of limited and, and you're challenging that where that center of gravity and the nervous system communicate with each other and kind of losing your balance a little bit. And then there's also, can you turn all the way around? So, you know, can I turn all the way around? And that's timed. Does it take you more than four seconds? Can I turn all the way around the other way? I think it probably took me about less than two seconds to do both of those turns. 
obviously, if you're going to create vertigo or you're going to get dizzy, you know, be very, very careful. Make sure someone's around you. They're, they're either contact guard, they're holding on to you, or you've got something to keep you safe if you know you've got balance deficits or impairments if you're at any risk. Always be safe when you're assessing yourself. Seek professional guidance if you need that. Um, and then we've got, uh, there's one, the, the one other thing, this is part of a of a, just a, an objective balance test that's used by my profession. But if you can alternate steps and, you know, can I write left, right, left, and you're kind of alternating, can you do a certain number of, of steps in a certain amount of time? Does it take you more than, and I forget what it, I don't even remember what it is. I think it's 10 seconds. I could be wrong. It might be 20 seconds, but can you get all eight steps in or do you have to hold on to something? Are you unstable? Can you not do it quickly? That kind of thing. So, and then the other thing that I wanted to, to show you on assessing your balance is putting your body in a certain position with your feet to sort of challenge one leg a little more than the other, and then moving your upper body in all three planes of motion. This, not only is this a really good assessment, for your stability, but it's also a great exercise. It's a great way to wake up your body. So I think that you'll all like this, at least I'm hoping you will. So when you go into a stride position, that simply means that one foot is forward and the other foot is back. And I'll show you from the side. You don't necessarily have to keep that back foot flat on the floor, but if you want to, you're gonna open up your hip a little more. You can put that foot flat and get that knee nice and straight. And now you've got a little more load here in the front, but that front leg you want to keep bent. And when you keep that front leg bent, you've got a little more load in the back of the hip. So you're kind of working back hip on one side, front hip on the other side. So you get a little bit of extra bang for your buck. And then when you're in that stride position, you want to make sure that foot is forward enough where it's almost like if you were going to start walking and you just took a step. So it's kind of a comfortable step forward. You don't want it to be too close to the other foot because that will make it very challenging to do the moves. And you want to make sure that you've got enough width between your feet so you're not on a tightrope. Because if you're on a tightrope, it's going to make you do this. So you have enough width, but only the width that you need to feel stable. So that said, you're going to get yourself into that stride position. I'm going to do my right foot forward. And then the upper body is going to do some different moves. If we can have your, your hands reach at about chair height or knee height and see, can you stay nice and stable when you reach there and do that three times, just see how that feels. Now, obviously, if anything hurts, don't do it. This is not about pain. This is assessment. And then keeping that front knee bent, can you reach up and back and kind of bend backward and do that three times? So this is with my right foot forward, and I'm doing those three repetitions with the forward reach and the overhead back reach. Kind of assesses what's going on between your center of gravity and your nervous system. Keeping in that position, now we're going to do some side bending. So if you put those arms up and you side bend to the right three times, you're going to feel your hips shift to the left when you do this. And then can you side bend to the left three times? you're gonna feel your hips shift to the right. Now, the reason we're doing three repetitions is because sometimes the first rep feels a little awkward. Your body's trying to figure out what you're asking it to do. And um, sometimes there's a little discomfort in one rep, but then reps two and reps three feel fine. Sometimes you can hang out for one or two reps and the third rep says, oh, I'm not sure I like this. So it's, it's three, gives you a good number. Now we're also gonna rotate. So we're still keeping those, those legs in that position. And then you're reaching your arms out in front of you and you're gonna turn as far as you can to the right. Can you point behind you or does that really throw off your balance? And then we're gonna to go to the left. And again, can you point behind you or are you limited? Does that really throw off your balance? So that's with the right foot forward and we're gonna do all those same movements with the left foot forward. Remember all the things, if you wanna keep that back leg nice and straight, that'll give you a little extra load on the front of that right hip and then on the back of the left hip. So we're keeping the legs like they were, but mirror image, gonna do all those same movements. So you're gonna go down at about knee height. We're gonna do that three times. 
And if you feel that right foot wants to come up, don't worry about it. it just means that that ankle might be a little limited in dorsiflexion for you. Then we're going to reach up and back and overhead. We're going to do that three times. You may notice, wow, I could do this really good on the other side, not so good here, or vice versa. Then we're going to put those arms up and we're going to side bend to the left. The hips are going to go right. And you're going to notice, do you feel stable? Do you feel unstable? And then we're going to side bend to the right. Hips are going to go left. And how do you feel? Do you feel good? Do you feel not so good? Is it kind of scary? Do you feel like you need to hold on or you shouldn't even do it? And then the last thing we're going to do is rotation. Arms are out. I'm going to rotate all the way around behind me to the left three times. Now, I notice myself, I'm not perfectly symmetrical with this one. I felt more stable rotating when my right foot was forward and I rotated left. But there's a reason for that because that really counts on the back hip when you're rotating to the same side. So, but I still noticed there was a little difference in all those movements. I wasn't quite as good rotating left when my left foot was forward as I was with all the other movements. So I'd be curious if any of you wanted to comment how you made out with this assessment. And of course, you know, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So that's kind of a quick and easy way to sort of assess your posture, how good is your stability when you're not moving, when you're moving, and then when you're challenging it in a stride position. And those are all very real things. I mean, if you go to get something out of the trunk of your car, you know, you're going to probably be in a stride position. Very rarely are your feet going to be side by side like this when you get something out of the trunk of the car. Almost always when we go to stress ourselves, it's an innate thing. Our brain just does it that that stronger leg is going to come forward because almost everybody has one leg that's a little stronger than the other that they count on more when they do things. I know I waited tables for years, especially through all my college years. And my strong leg was in front when I went to lift one of those real heavy trays and put it on my shoulder to, to, to go out. So, um, you know, your body will just do that innately. So, and the same thing, if you notice, whenever you go downstairs, your body is going to usually count on you the stronger leg is going to be your, your supporting leg when you take that first step down the stairs. Almost always your brain figures out which side it likes better, that it trusts more. So now what I'd like to do is show you a couple of exercises to sort of influence the posture, influence the fascia. Now, please know that one of the main reasons I showed so many anatomy pictures was to show you that there's no well, do this one exercise and it'll eliminate forward head posture. Or, you know, you'll see these kind of titles all over the place, especially if you're on YouTube. You know, this one movement will fix low back pain. And, you know, each person is unique as a fingerprint. And you've got your own history, childhood, injuries, traumas, surgeries, illnesses, food intake, water intake, sports histories. Uh, sedentary lifestyle versus active lifestyle. Every single person is unique as a fingerprint. There is no one exercise that fixes anything. So, but it doesn't mean that you've got to do 4,000 different movements to resolve things. What it means is you need to be doing some variety in your training and make sure that your training is really authentic in how the body moves, which is in three planes of motion. And a lot of people, when they go to do things, they're only working in one plane of motion, especially at the gym. And I spent most of my career working with people who hung out in a gym four or five, six days a week, and they were really fit, but boy, they had tendonitis and all kinds of issues because of how we train our bodies. It's not authentic. It's not the way it was designed to be. And just a real quick example, if I go to push something up on a shelf something heavy, put a box up on a shelf, I'm not going to stand there and go, okay, I can't bend my knees. I've got to keep my feet perfectly straight. I have to make sure that I only use my anterior deltoid and I don't use any other muscle. Our bodies aren't designed to function that way. So why do we train them that way? So, okay. So what I'm going to show you is how to do a shoulder matrix and a matrix is when you're using all three planes of motion, but I'm going to show you how to do it where you're loading the front of the body. Because most people, when it comes to posture, 
they're, this is what they're concerned about. So this is going to help you to get that upper body back. It's a great way to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. This is just one way that I'm going to show you. Now, if you have any shoulder deficits or impairments, please don't harm yourself. Um, if your neck is not happy with some of the movements that you do, a nice little modification is to keep your eyes fixed on something so that your head doesn't become part of the movement. And what I mean by that is if your arm comes up and I ask you to look up and back, my head is going to follow that motion. But if your neck doesn't like that, if I keep my eyes fixed, I can come up and back, but you can see my head isn't going into extension. So that might protect your neck. And the kind of cool thing about that is, is you're sort of mobilizing your neck from below and it might actually help your neck to feel better if you have neck pain. So that, that could be a little, little bonus, um, but don't do anything that causes pain, especially repetitively, because your brain is just trying to figure out how to stop you from hurting yourself and it's going to cheat and you're going to train in dysfunction. Um, you're going to use the wrong muscles, the wrong way, the wrong pathways, and it's not going to achieve the goal that is in place with that movement. So that said, let's do the shoulder matrix. I'm gonna show you the movements. So there are actually six movements to do the entire shoulder matrix because there is a forward motion and a backward motion for the sagittal plane. And there's a right side bend and a left side bend for the frontal plane. And there's a right rotation and a left rotation for the transverse plane. When we do the shoulder motions, Three of them really focuses on loading more the back of the shoulders and the upper back, and the other three focus more on loading the front of the shoulders or the upper front trunk of the body. And since the goal is to get you back and up, opening that up and getting that to allow you to go backward without falling back and losing control is a good idea. Now, obviously loading the back muscles so that when you, know, when you go forward, those back muscles are stronger to pull you up out of that is also a good idea. But most people, it's the front that's really gotten tight and just not functioning well. So I'm gonna show you those three. And then I'm also gonna show you something that can really help to provide a deep stabilizing improvement in your core, um, especially the pelvis and the hips. So, so first we'll do the shoulders. So the movements are where you're gonna kind of come down a little in just a teeny little squat position, just to sort of load the body and get ready to push off into the motion. Your shoulders love it when you allow your whole body to be part of the team. And so you're gonna come down just a little bit. And then when you come up, you're going to reach up overhead and bend backward. And you're gonna feel the whole front of the body work. And then when you come down, now I'm gonna reach up with the other arm and go backward. So you'll see it's this beautiful alternating, you come down, I'm going back, down, I'm going back, and you're gonna feel everything load. And if your shoulders are good, you know, really try to get that shoulder back as far as you can as well, because that's gonna help to get that thoracic spine, that upper trunk spine to go into a healthy extension, as long as there's no pain. So that's one motion. Another motion for the side to side movement or plane of motion is going overhead. So you'll see the hip kind of slides under the arm that's lifting up overhead because that gives it a beautiful support under the shoulder girdle. And I'll show you that from the back. So if my right arm goes up overhead like this, my, my hips kind of slide to the right. And then I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side and my hips slide to the left. Now, the goal with that one is try to do it without bending forward or backward or turning because we're trying to stay in that plane of motion and that is authentic. So just alternating as you're going. And you can, you can notice if you keep your arm and really get it right to your head and really reach over, and the same thing with the other side, you can notice you're kind of feeling the front of your body load as well as the side. And then the last one for this is rotation. And for that one, it's kind of like, I kind of joke and say, it's sort of like a big giant snuck up behind me and I'm gonna give him an uppercut to kind of keep him from attacking me, right? So it's sort of a joke, but it makes you, gives you a good visual on where you're aiming. So if I kind of wind up a little bit 
And then I rotate as I come up. So I'm turning and I'm going up sort of at an angle. You can see that angle there. So it might even be, say, if you had a doorway behind you and I'm kind of coming up and I want to sort of reach to the opposite corner of the top of the doorway with that arm and then the opposite with this arm. So instead of the right top corner, it's the left top corner. And the same thing here, my right arm is going to the right top corner instead of the left. And as you can see, I'm, I'm using the body, I'm using physics, ground reaction force, gravity, mass and momentum, all those things that my shoulders love because I'm not asking them to do all the work without anybody else helping down below. Because usually the shoulders are screaming out going, why aren't you letting them help? And the rest of the body is saying, why won't you let me help my friend up there? So that's really kind of how everything works. So hopefully you'll enjoy those and that will help to open everything up. And then the other thing I wanted to show when it comes to balance or stability is a way where you can use all three planes of motion again to kind of get everything here stable. And those, these are one of my favorites to teach, which is toe taps. And it's simply tapping a foot forward, but not putting weight on the toes, just barely touching the floor. And you can see I'm kind of leaning back when I do this and I'm not toe dumping, I'm just tapping. And you're gonna feel the front of that hip load. And then it's the same thing if you tap behind you, you can see I'm leaning forward a little bit and I'm just barely touching those toes on the floor. And now I'm loading the back of this hip. And then if I go out to the side, I'm leaning into this leg here. And when I do this, I'm really loading the inner part of this hip that I'm standing on. And if I cross over, I'm loading the outer part of this hip that I'm standing on. And if you put your hand on your hip, you're gonna feel that come up just a little bit as you tap, this is a beautiful way to load the hips, the pelvis, all those deep stabilizing mechanisms. And of course, for safety, if you need to hold on when you're doing this, that is not a problem. Just, you know, even if you just use one finger, your brain now says, oh, we're safe. We're not gonna fall. We've got some support here. So it's using the right muscles the right way because you're safe, but you wanna feel that hip kind of come up. That's really gonna load that outer hip. Outer hips, Inner hips, a huge issue for a lot of people, especially if you get pain in your knees when you walk, outer inner hip may not be working properly. Um, front hip, of course, because of all the sitting, it shortens. Back hip, all the sitting, you're sitting on the power source, those muscles, they'll, they'll atrophy, they'll shrink, they'll weaken. And then of course, we've got the other plane of motion for those of you who may be paying attention, rotation. And that's very simple. You're just gonna turn in in front of that foot and kind of make a, a letter T where you just turn in. And then the other one is to turn out and your feet are kind of making the letter L. Now I make this look easy because I don't have any deficits. I'm very thankful for that, but you may need to hold on. You, know, you may not have full motion. You may only be able to go halfway. If you go further, you might feel some pain or, or it may not be happy about it. Whatever you do, make sure you do it if you're doing it in repetition, where your body is successful, you're competent, and you're confident with the move, your body will build on success. If you can't do something and you just keep trying to do that same thing over and over, you're only going to train in dysfunction. You're not going to build on success. You're going to build on failure. And that's not how the body works. So find where you're successful, start there. And you'll see, I've had, I, I can't tell you how many people have reported to me, emailed me or people I work with or whatever, that when they made sure they did things when it didn't hurt and they could do it well, they could not believe how much better they got, how quickly they got there. So the human body is phenomenal. And uh, it, just as long as you know the right things to do, you can improve just about anything. So Hopefully that uh, that helped everybody, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, AJ, if there right, are. Right, thank you. Do you uh, see people, is that a gym that you just use for yourself, or do you actually see clients there if they live near you? No, this is just where I do live classes and record from. I don't see anybody here, no. Unfortunately, yeah, when the when the world shut down, the, the clinic I was in shut down briefly, 
And then I didn't go back. I just went full time from home because I can help a lot more people from here. Nice. Than there. Well, do, do you use those machines yourself? Uh, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's the stationary bike. I don't use that that much anymore because I'm tired of sitting because, you know, when the world shut down, I did a lot more research and content creation. So I was sitting too much. Um, that one I like because I'm up. But I, I actually, my favorite thing is to walk. I live in an area where I have the most beautiful roads, uh, dirt roads, woods. I go by the cows. Um, I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous. There's a gorgeous waterfall that I walk over. Um, I, I love to walk. That's my favorite thing. Any pets? I have one cat who we adopted many years ago who is spoiled rotten and also loves to be outside, but loves to be inside when it snows. And it's so funny, the first time it snows, when I open the door and she looks at the snow, she looks up at me like, what did you do? <laughs> I tell so her no, I didn't do it. <laughs> nice. So no, no doggy to walk with. You know, that, no. thing, that blue thing behind the bike, those are, those are fun. Those are difficult to use, but those are kind of fun. Oh, the BOSU ball. Yes. Yeah, I bought that because my youngest daughter had an issue with excessive pronation and she was experiencing some knee issues. And so the BOSU ball, you can do a beautiful thing of improving supination in the feet and, and improving the knee alignment works really well. They have a class at Rancho La Puerta in BOSU ball. It's really fun. It's challenging, but it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> Very challenging. Yes. Yep. So I have some questions. Susanna would like to know, is it best for our posture to sit as little as possible? You know, like there's that saying, sitting is the new smoking. Yeah. So I just did a um, an event on that. I did a reverse sitting pain event, which was um, just last month, I think. I lose track now. And I did some updated research because for many years, all the research I had looked at said that even if you exercise an hour a day, if you sit for eight hours or more a day, that a one hour exercise will not negate the damage from all the sitting. And so, and that's pretty negative. I mean, that kind of, kind of speaks death into your life. It's like, well, okay, well, I'm, you know, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. Why would I even try? So I did some updated research and I dug into some of the details of the data and come to find out that <clears throat> it really was about the people who saw the increased damage per se, um, even if they exercised, were the smokers and those who were carrying a lot of excess weight. So that meant those who aren't smoking and those who work to achieve a healthy weight, they don't have that same negative thing. If they're exercising, it will reverse the effects of prolonged sitting. So, um, but I think the biggest thing that I always teach Susanna, and that was a really good question, is to get up consistently because, and then there are people, and I just did a, um, I did a YouTube video on getting, uh, what do you do if you can't stand up? So you're on an airplane and the seatbelt light is on and you can't stand up. What do you do? Uh, you're a cab driver. You can't stand up. What do you do? So I, you know, I showed some strategies there, but ideally if you can stand up, getting up every 20 minutes to 30 minutes and doing 10 back bends and 10 what I call chair squats to to wake up the glutes and to open up the front of the hips is is a beautiful idea to do it's that that not sitting without getting up is what really wreaks a lot of havoc on people great thank you and this is a question from Ella I already have a hump on my back in my 50s how can I start to improve my posture it feels uncomfortable to stand up straight like I know I should my daughter also has the same type of posture in her early 30s. Is this hereditary? Mm. So, well, there's a lot. The hereditary is a big topic because oftentimes we mimic what we see. I mean, you'll see a, a young boy walking behind his dad and walking exactly how his dad walks. So we don't know how much of it is mimicking behaviors. And, you know, I don't know that it's genetic per se. Uh, I knew that obviously we can carry some genet genetic predispositions like certain disease processes. But again, those are typically triggered by diet and food intake. So, so there's that. Um, and then habit habits. I always tell people we inherit our family recipes and uh, we also inherit our family habits. So there's all of that. I do know that if, if the, the spine has not fused in that position where it will allow motion, um, things can be done. A lot of the times it just simply laying on the stomach and, you know, 
depending on how the head is comfortable um, and, and just allowing gravity to sort of pull the chest down into the floor and then doing some work with, you know, lifting the head, lifting the arms. I mean, I'm not, not trying to treat this person, Ella. I don't, you know, cause this could, you might want to seek some expert guidance, but um, just starting to, to use gravity to help can, can be beneficial. So starting in, in prone or, or face down positions might be helpful. Um, so that now, you know, it, it's going to be less. Also, you could do supine where you're lying on your back and without any pillows. And um, that's where I teach a monthly melt class, which is really good for that. Because once you get on the roller, you don't need a pillow. But I've had people who need when they lay on their back, they need two pillows because of a forward head, do some roller work and get off the roller and they no longer need a pillow because their head is in a different position. So that's very helpful as well. And that really targets the whole fascial system. So a lot can be done. Um, it doesn't mean that it's too late. Thank you. Right. And you work with people virtually one-on-one -on -one as well as in your classes, right? I do. Yes. Great. Thank you. Rat says, are sit-ups and push-ups good for encouraging proper posture and, and your core strength for pushing yourself up or down? Or is there something that's better to do? Mm. I'm not a big lover of sit-ups. Mainly because um, your your abdominals are really designed to stabilize you, and the best way they work is in upright positions. So a really good way to load those is to be standing and maybe have a band where you've got some resistance and come forward. And now this band really wants to pull me backward. So I'm loading the front of the body and then I come and unload it, but it's staying loaded when you do this. So this is a great way to work the abs. You can do it in stride. You can do it in all different ways. Um, it's better than sit-ups. If you're going to do sit-ups, I highly recommend using a therapy ball and mine's upstairs in the office. I don't have it down here, but if you, if you, lie on the therapy ball and, and your hands are here. Now you can go down into an extended position before you come up. So it's going to, it's going to give a much more intense load on the muscles and be more authentic and less stressful to the low back typically. Um, and then push-ups, push-ups are great. They're really good at working upper back, but a lot of people don't have enough strength to do a push-up. So a lot of times what I teach is what I call a scat press where you're you're keeping your arms straight. So say I'm against a wall or a counter or a floor, depending on the person's ability. And then you're letting the scaps go back, but you're not going into a full-fledged push-up with the bent elbow. That will work the upper back muscles as well. But um, yeah, push-ups are great. And you don't have to do push-ups in perfect position with the hands. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the times we think we've got to have these perfect positions. There's a reason for having certain positions, but in real life, we rarely have perfect positions. So if you train a little out of sync with things, the body is a lot more adapted to handling real life and less likely for injury. So you can do like 27 different hand positions when you're doing push-ups. When the hands are closer, you're going to get a lot more tricep. When they're wider, you're going to get more pec. You can put one hand forward. You can turn hands in. You can turn hands out. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with push-ups. Yeah, but they're great. Thank you. So Honeybee says, what are the three planes of motion? Okay, so I obviously failed at, at, at teaching that well when I was doing my slides. So thank you for that. Um, so the three planes of motion are forward and back. So that's the sagittal plane, which you don't need to know. It's just forward and back. And then there's side to side, and that's the frontal plane. So in the, in the sagittal plane, forward and back, you know, arms do this, that's sagittal, legs do this, that's sagittal, and, um, and then, of course, the trunk. And then the side to side, arms, this is frontal, legs, this is frontal. And then we've got rotation or the transverse plane, and that's the trunk turns, your arms, if my arm is here and I do this, that's rotation. If I hold it here and I do this, that's rotation. And then it's the same with the, with the leg. If I do this, that's rotation. Or if I do this, that's rotation. So the reason we don't look like robots when we move is because we almost every movement we make 
<clears throat> incorporates all three planes of motion in some way. And if you ever seen people do that, the, the robot dance, they're doing one plane of motion at a time, which is why they don't look like human movements. Good question. Thank you. And here's a question from Dixie. What to work on to improve jumping? Jumping. Okay. So um, it depends on your goal. Why are, you know, what is it you're looking to accomplish with jumping? But the, the, the neat thing about human movement is whenever we go to do something, we always kind of wind the body up to get ready to do it. And what I mean by that is, is if I was going to swing a tennis racket and I wanted to hit the ball, I don't just do this and hit the ball. It's not going to go very far. I wind up first and then I hit the ball. The same with golf. When you go to hit the, the golf ball, you are winding up first and then you're hitting the ball with a baseball bat, all those things. <clears throat> when it comes to jumping, you, you're not going to just jump. You got to wind up first. You've got to go down before you can push up and jump. And so ideally, if there's a struggle with that, there's some weakness going on in the glutes, gluteus maximus, good old max, where our power source is. Your hamstrings also be able, have to be able to load because they go from the butt bone right down past the knee. And when I do this, the hamstrings are getting longer up here. So they have to load well in order to unload, to push me back up to jump. And then of course, your calves, when I come down like this, my ankles are doing something called dorsiflexion where the toes come up. So my calves are getting longer and getting ready to explode or unload with that motion. So now I can jump. It's sort of like, I got my magic monkey here. So your muscles have to get longer before they can release energy to perform any kind of a strenuous task. So if you want to jump, you've got to be able to lengthen the muscles that are responsible for then shortening and pushing your body up off the ground into a flight phase. So doing, you know, doing squats, working the calves, that kind of thing might really help somebody who's struggling to jump. Great. Thank you. Here's a question from Diana. No, it's not from Diana. Sorry about that. It's from Sonia. Excuse me. If someone has had fusion of the spine, L3, 4, and 5, does that change your approach to posture? <clears throat> so when someone has had a fusion, a lumbar fusion, typically, and again, this isn't me diagnosing or treating someone, typically the reason a fusion is there is because there's instability or perhaps they've lost the height and now they're getting a lot of pressure on the nerve roots. And so they go in there with a cage and they put in a, a spacer and get that back. Now, if it's fused, it's not going to move. Ideally, that's what the fusion is for. Now, unfortunately, fusions do tend to fail at a pretty high rate, which means movement does happen or a fusion above or below needs to happen because the segments that aren't moving are causing the ones above and below to move more. So there's a lot to fusions. Um, the, when it comes to posture, if it's a lumbar fusion, because the lumbar spine has, you know, that nice healthy curve, just that little curve in, we don't want a great big sway back curve. We don't want a flattened out curve. We want just a nice healthy curve. Ideally, when the fusion is done, they're not trying to remove or increase the curve. And because the lumbar spine has very little ability to rotate or side bend, as long as that's happening above the lumbar and below it in the pelvis and the hips, the lumbar can handle it. Now, it's not going to do a lot of flexion or extension, which may alter some things in function but not necessarily just posture. So it, it would really be specific to the person, what's going on. If they've lost a lot of strength in the glutes so that now you know, their, their body's kind of kind of struggling just to even stay upright and, and things kind of shift to try to stay there, that would be, it would be really specific to the person. Thanks. Got another question here from LM. What about so many women with degenerative scoliosis of the lumbar spine? What programs can help them with posture and their upper body strength? 
So scoliosis is <clears throat> something that it can either be functional, it can be structural. Structural means that typically it starts at an early age and it, start, it progresses to like where, where it gets out of control once you get over, I think it's 31, I'm, I forget, 30 something degrees. Once it gets over that, you've got to have surgery um, or at least they used to. Now they're doing very different treatments, protocols where they're putting almost like a an iron girdle on these young kids and they have to sleep in it because it's kind of preventing the curvature from progressing. So there's a lot of different ways to treat that now. If it's what would be called a functional scoliosis, which means it's happened because of habitual postures and repetitive movements and, and that kind of thing, nobody really knows why some people get scoliosis and some people don't, especially if it's functional. You know, the bottom line is what happens is the muscles on one side of the spine are shortening and the other side of the spine, they're weakening and getting longer, allowing that curve. Now there's different kinds of scoliosis. There's a C curve and there's a right C curve and a left C curve, depending on which way your spine is going. There's also an S curve, which typically is because the body, because your eyes wanna be here. So if I'm like this, I'm not gonna walk around like that. My upper body kind of wants to counterbalance. So now I've got an S curve and there's an S curve and a reverse S curve, depending on you know which way the S is going. So. It really depends on the person's curvature. It depends on how much the curvature is there. Uh, in my free membership in the private club, I have an article on scoliosis. It was a really well done article where they used side plank positionings to improve the curves in scoliosis by like 30%. It was a really good improvement. There's also a lot that can be done as far as training the body, and um, but it has to be very specific to that person's curve so that they know how to do it correctly. And it's all about positioning because there's always a side bend and a rotation component to it. So the person needs to know which way they're working. And you're not always, and I don't mean to make this sound confusing, but you would think, so if I had a curve where I was like this, you would think the last thing I'd want to do is to go this way with my training. You would think I would only want to go this way. However, sometimes if I go this way first, it sort of alleviates the stress and then it will allow me to come out of it more readily. So, and then, you know, if I'm going to side bend that way, and I'm going to rotate this way. So you kind of get this combined motion. And then sometimes the person has to have a foot up because a lot of the times the pelvis will be crooked because of the curve. And so you want to get the pelvis nice and level first before you start doing the side bending and the rotation. But it's really specific to the person. And um, and I will give a shout out. There's a, a, a um, colleague from where I get all my tr my three plane training from, his name is Ed Paget, P A G E T, and he has a lot of amazing videos on YouTube for scoliosis. He's he's really well versed in it, and um, and and teaches some great stuff on there for that topic. Thank you, Roseanne. Would like to know: Are the exercises you have shown safe for people with osteoporosis? So if a person has osteoporosis, if they have an active fracture, that's different than if they don't have an active fracture. Um, if someone's been diagnosed with osteoporosis, ideally when they're diagnosed, they're given a very specific protocol of things to not do. Uh, if it's spinal osteoporosis, they don't want to do a lot of flexion forward because that's going to put pressure on the the anterior portion of the vertebrae, which can put them at a real high risk of a compression fracture. So there are specifics that people who are diagnosed with osteoporosis have been told not to do. If they haven't been told anything, then they really need to contact their caregiver and get better informed because it really is whoever's diagnosing them needs to make sure they know these things. Um, there's certain yoga moves that are not recommended. There are, um, but a lot of yoga can be really good for them. I just did a real deep dive into all the research behind this uh, because of a course that I co-created with someone. And, um, and there's a lot of movements that have been shown to improve the density of the femur, the thigh bone, and improve the density of the spine. Um, there are some movements that while they don't improve the density, 
they will maintain density, like walking. Walking will maintain it, but it won't improve it. So um, yeah, if somebody has osteoporosis, they really need to make sure that they're well-informed with the things they should not do. So that, you know, like trying to open a, a window that sticks could create a rib fracture. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't live your life. You don't want to live your life in fear, but you need to be wise and know movements that aren't your friend. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Here's a question from Marsha. What do you think about those vests to wear for good posture? So I'm not sure if they're talking about a weighted vest to add work to them, or if they're talking about some kind of a wraparound support that pulls them into good posture. I'm not sure which they mean. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, once was. I don't know which one she means either. And maybe she can clarify in the chat. A long time ago, I was in a car accident and I got one and it was really cool. It actually makes you look really good. It gives you like this slim, like kind of waist and it just, it makes you sit up straight, like, but uh, to kind of to train your muscles, like it's a, like a training vest. You're not supposed to wear it all the time. Right. So, so the thing with external support for the body, the body has this unique ability to do as little work as possible or what's required of it. So when you provide external support for any length of time, like you said, AJ, you're not supposed to wear it all the time. When you provide external support, it's not really training your muscles to do the right thing. It's just kind of holding you in that position. So it, it's sort of like, you know, if I go to somebody and they treat me some way, whether it's acupuncture or acupressure or massage therapy or whatever it is, they're externally influencing my body but that's not going to train my muscles to do what they're designed to do. The only thing that will do that is doing the right movements repetitively. Great. Thanks. How do we, Denise wants to know, how can I encourage good posture in my slumpy teenagers? <laughs> slumpy. <laughs> I like that word. Slumpy. Yes. Um, yes. I, I saw somebody had a really good title for that and I can't remember it now. It was really funny. So um the biggest issue with the teenagers is this. This is what they're doing the for phone. hours a day. Yep, I figured you're going to say that. Right. And even sitting, you know, they sit down and, and this is, this is what they're doing. Right. So I'm thinking my profession is going to have a lot of work cut out for them in the next 10 years or so because of all that. The, so what I do is I teach them, I think, Probably the best advice I can give. I'll never forget when I was a fairly new PT, I was, I was waiting for the results of my licensure exam and I was working in a clinic and I had a, a teenage girl. She was a high school senior and uh, she was a tennis player. And she came in to see me because she had developed some shoulder pain. Uh, no, actually it wasn't tennis. I'm sorry. It was volleyball. She had developed some shoulder pain uh, and she was a really good volleyball player. And so, and, and she was like this. And so when I explained to her, when you go to lift your shoulder up, it'll only go so far until you get yourself nice and straight. And then you've got a lot more shoulder. I said, so when you're loading to hit that ball, you're limited in how much you're loading it because you're like this. So if you're like this, you're going to load it more. It's going to unload better and you're not going to stress your shoulder. So she started looking at pictures. Now, here's the funny part. Her mother said something to the bus driver. So the bus driver was nagging her to sit up straight when she was on the bus. But she looked at pictures of herself at her junior prom. And these were her words, not mine. She goes, I'm disgusted by my posture. Look at my posture at my junior prom. So to her, it became, and I don't want to say vanity like it's a bad thing, but she didn't like how she looked once it was brought to her attention. So teenagers tend to want to look good. We all want to look good. I want to look good. I'm guessing you do too. So if you kind of maybe take that vein and somehow some way get them to see this is really not very attractive maybe it will spur them to to do something about it great thank you um i'm 65 and had rotator cuff surgery on both shoulders eight days ago is it okay to do we push-ups or not Kind of soon, isn't well, it? I would think if you're just eight days post-surgical, you've been given a protocol by your surgeon and hopefully you're seeing a healthcare professional for therapy of some kind. Um, 
And, you know, a lot of the times rotator cuff post-surgical, you're still in a sling and you're not even supposed to be actively using those muscles. So I'm not sure where you are in the whole healing process. So I cannot give you any direct advice. You need to make sure that it's okay with your surgeon and it's okay with whoever you're working with to rehab after the surgery. Absolutely. Dixie wants to know if your boot camp is on Zoom. I'm sure it is because you mentioned yes. it. Yes, yeah, yes. you moved to Zoom. Perfect. And Marcia said the vest she was talking about was the one that pulls you into good posture. Okay. Okay. And we we discussed that. I think we covered yeah. that. I just just because I followed up because it, she 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 okay. heard me. She, so thank you. And let's see if there's any more questions. I just nice comment. Lots of people have nice comments, but for example, Sid says, Truly Eileen is the most incredible PT ever. So much knowledge. And um I mean, you know, you always hear like I, I've heard that like your ability to get up off the floor without using your hands is predictive of something. Is that like, I mean, should I strive for that? Because sometimes I can do it, but sometimes I can't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important to be able to get up off the floor. Um, whether or not you have to use your hands, is that a predictor of future decline? Potentially. Um, a lot of the times if someone does fall, the reason they struggle to get up is because they lack upper body strength and they can't push their upper body up off the floor so they can get to a sitting or a kneeling position. So upper body strength does matter. Um, I remember I had a patient, I'll never forget, she was in her 80s and she had had an amputation. I think it was above knee. I don't remember if it was above or below knee, but she had a prosthetic leg and her goal was to be able to get on and off the floor without her prosthesis on. Because she thought if ever she lost her balance, because if she got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, she used her walker and she would hop there, you know, on the one leg because she's not going to take the time to put her prosthetic leg on to go use the bathroom in the middle of the night. It's time consuming. And so she wanted to be able to get on and off the floor. And we we were able to do that. She worked hard to be able to do that. Um, but it is it is an important ability to be able to get on and off the floor. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but so, but I, my, I can do that, but sometimes I have to use my hands. So is that a deal breaker or should I keep, what can I do to make it? So right. that I, I don't know that it's a deal breaker per se, as long as you can get on and off the floor and it's fairly graceful. Mm. A lot of times people, they're like, they're really struggling to get up mm. and um, yeah. And getting off the toilet. That's important. Some people, you know, I have a, had a brother-in-law who was a firefighter. And he said one of the number one calls was get people up off the toilet. Yes. And, you know, it's funny, AJ, that you mentioned that because toilets used to be really low. When I first worked in acute care, we were in an older building. The hospital was quite old. And the toilets, they looked to me, it was like, am I in a kindergarten bathroom? The toilet was so low. I couldn't believe it. because That's where <laughs> how they made them, right? Now they've got standard height toilets everywhere. The toilets are like, 12 inches higher than they ever used to be because people struggle to get on and off. Wow. Yes. Pretty soon they'll be standing toilets, huh? Um, <laughs> Opal says, I've had a stroke and I have hemiparesis on my right and left side. Do you have any suggestions? So depending on the deficit, a lot can be done. I've worked with a lot of people who were post-stroke where, you know, they had one arm like this and, and they had to, you know, their walking was very, very limited. Um, it really depends on your specific impairment and, and a lot of weight bearing is, is very much advised for people, you know, work with somebody who knows what they're doing, who, who is an expert in that area and will give you good guidance, but weight bearing is huge. The more weight bearing done, the better the body functions. There's also a beautiful technique called strain and counter strain. That is, it's a manual technique that if you can find a clinician who does that either a physical therapist or a massage therapist. Um, it's called strain and counter strain. And that can be really good if there's some hyper function going on in the muscles. A lot of the times post-stroke people will get a, their, their shoulder will literally kind of dislocate a little because of the stuff going on in the muscles. The strain and counter strain technique can help to negate that. Uh, it can be very, very effective at helping the body to function better. So I recommend finding somebody who knows that and as much weight bearing as possible, whether it's on the arms, you know, if you've got this chair has no arms, but if it had arms, you know, doing, doing pressing, um, just a lot of weight bearing, if you don't have any joint issues or pain or other reasons that would limit that. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. And this is from 
Joan, I saw how you changed your head position when describing teens on their phone, but is there an exercise you can recommend to practice getting your head back? Okay, so um, to get them to use the phone in a healthy way, what I usually will teach them is instead of doing this, this. So you just you're just holding the phone up. You can even rest your elbows in your trunk if you want, but having the phone up so that you just have to look down a little bit with your eyes completely changes the position of the head while you're using the phone completely. And you can do that sitting as well. So just, just hold the phone up here. If you can teach a teenager ager to do that alone will make a big difference. Eileen, this is fabulous. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I hope it helped a lot of people. I think it did. And people can watch it again. And that's the great thing. Yes. It's like having a private yes. first off. Uh, physical therapy session. Yes. So great to see you again. Yes, you too, AJ. Thank you. And thanks all of Thank you, you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Two shows tomorrow. I hope you'll come back for the first one at 9 a.m. with Dr. Lori Marvis. She's going to talk about five ways that you can lower your blood pressure naturally. Take